Um, I've been doing public speaking for years, and I wish I could remain that calm. <laughs> My friends always would tell me, slow it down, Bob, slow it down, but you did it absolutely phenomenal. And you got some absolutely great leadership here with Joan and Carol. Um, it, it, it's a phenomenal group, and I am just so um, uh, ex excited about how everyone is, is finally waking up. Uh, you know, after that last election, I started to get worried, like, oh, we're, we're just surrendering America. Uh, but it's good to see that America has finally woken up and we're getting back to the principles that made us so great. Um, this presentation, I put it on a disc. I'll be giving it here to Joan. So if you have, want a copy right here, um, you have it here. Um, for the last six years, we've been doing the conservative lecture series. And one of the favorite ones we have is the global warming one. What's nice about the global warming one is that I was really taking off the people I liked to take off. <laughs> I mean, that was a lot of fun. When I hit the Federal Reserve, though, um, I started to, to notice that um, I lose a lot of friends here. So what, what I what I uh, what I asked to do is leave the pitchforks at the um, door because um, what I'm going to do is I'm, gonna, I'm, I'm trying to give a um, we have to be objective about these issues. And you know I've been teaching economics, studying economics, and I'm practicing the financial world, and I started to see a whole lot of stuff being thrown around. And I'm thinking, wait a minute, that's not even close to being uh, being accurate. And what I'm concerned with is that when you go out into public and you start saying things, mm -hmm. you're going to say things that, you know, you may have read a thousand times over and over again, mm -hmm. but when you get outside of our group, it makes no sense at all, you know? <laughs> and that's the problem. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to try to be objective. Uh, I'm going to show you a bunch of things. Um, first of all, I'm a real big fan of Glenn Beck. I'm going to have a little video clip of Glenn Beck in here. You're going to get the push forks out of it. But, um, uh, it, it, but the whole key is, um, this is an educational experience. I'm going to say some things you're probably going to dis disagree with. Um, watch the road. I'm going to go, the, the presentation goes rather quick, and then we're going to get a question and answer. That's the fun part. All right? So remember, put down the pitchforks and, and open up the mic. And I passed out these cards, excuse me, so that you can write your questions as he goes along through it. Maybe you go too fast and just write your questions down. All right, one thing I always do when I go through, I always forget to uh, recognize Roy. <laughs> okay, so we got Roy. Roy, if you haven't seen some of Roy's videos, we have some great ones from down at the State House, Tuesdays and Thursdays. We went out to take out the unions. And uh, by the way, if you don't see me get after this, check the dumpsters behind the union hall. <laughs> I have a feeling they've got a, a bounty on it. Um, the other thing is, one of the big things is competing currencies. Um, I'm going to be saying a lot of things and it's just like, oh my gosh, he's disagreeing with what we're saying. Um, all, the bottom line is the end point I totally agree with. Competing currencies is a great idea. Um, I hope you ask questions about it because you can do it right now. Um, and so once again, I'm going to say some things that are going to challenge what you think, all right? But remember, in the end, I agree with you, all right? All right, so open your minds, all right? And forget what you've been told, all right? And just listen for a little bit. Um, because education is the key, and this is basically some, uh, these are journalism majors, and, and you know, they, they have some headlines here, and, and here's just a couple of examples on why education is so important. Uh, something went wrong in jet crash, experts say. Uh, my favorite one is, panda mating fails, veterinarian takes it. <laughs> okay, and uh, this one's really timely right here. Uh, if the strike, strike isn't settled quickly, it may last a while, right? <laughs> so that's what my point is. We have to be educated, all right? Now, this is what I'm saying. Put the pitchforks down. Here's a, here's a little clip. And what I try to do with this clip is say, okay, we all watch Glenn Beck. We all love him. But if you're not a fan of Glenn Beck, this is what you're seeing, mm -hmm. all right? So remember, this is a non-Glenn Beck fan watching the video. Because I put a little comments in here so that you understand where, what they're saying. As the country or any country ever devalued its way to economic prosperity. That you have to answer. I hope so. Because that is the path our government is taking us down. The Fed can keep playing tricks to mask the real problems, but not for very long. Inflation, there's no masking the rising cost of inflation, is there? I mean, have you been to the grocery store? Here's what inflation is. A persistent substantial rise, a persistent substantial rise, a persistent substantial <laughs> rise in the general level, general level, general level of prices related to an increase in the volume of money and resulting in the loss of value of currency. Got it? First part, substantial rise in the general level of prices related to an increase in the volume of money supply. So, if they weren't printing anything, 
and this orange juice here was a dollar. And then they started to print more money. The orange juice would cost more because there are too many dollars out there now trying to buy that one glass of orange juice. <coughs> Hey, remember that, remember that formula. That's the whole key. Well, does that happen? The experts say, of course not. Really? <coughs> well, let's look around the world. Well, let's look around the world. Well, let's look around the world. UK's inflation levels hit 4%. Eurozone's inflation levels jumped to 2.4. And that ain't it. Experts... Experts are now predicting the new luxury item in America will be this. Orange juice? They say factory prices and problem with drought, problem with drought, problem with drought. <laughs> factory prices could rise as much as 80% as for orange juice and 60% for apple juice. Let me show you what has happened with six month price percentage moves. This is six months, this isn't over a year, six months with just a few of the necessities. Here they are. Cotton is up 125%. Six months, sugar 82, corn 59%, coffee 41%, rice 40%. Let's look at some others. Oats. If you're a horse, panic. Cotton, <laughs> 36%. Lumber, you want to build a house? Up to 3%. Put some gutters on it, why don't you? Or just have that old-fashioned thing called electricity. Oil, During that same six month stretch, what has the dollar done? The dollar has dropped by 6%. Cotton is up 125% by 6%. Sugar 82 by 6%. Corn 59%. Every time we print more money, the value of your dollar that you have earned at work goes down, making the price go up by 6%. Let me tell you just about cotton. Let me show you a real life example. This is cotton. Just in the last six months, cotton has gone up 125%. So you have to go out and buy a new shirt. This is a great shirt. This is a non-Iron Brooks Brothers shirt. These are fantastic shirts. This shirt was, six months ago, $79.50. Today, it is $88. Here it is. But the real hidden trick is the hidden value of your dollar. It's like a hidden tax. The value in the same time of your dollar has dropped 6%. So you need to add another 6% to the cost of this. Because it takes more of your dollars to buy them. So it makes it not $88, but actually $93 for this shirt. <laughs> Does that sound like a recipe for success? Especially when the government continues to spend and print. Okay, now what I want that, what I created that video for is so that you start <coughs> thinking about it. I try, I try to highlight some things so that it starts, starts you thinking, so that you, you can come up with some questions to ask here in a second. Okay. Has the con Okay, this is what, I mean, if you try to take monetary policy, it all boils down into a nutshell. MV equals PQ. This is the quantity theory of money. This is the dry part of the presentation. <laughs> but this is what it all comes down to, a simple formula. And so when he says you print money, prices go higher. That's what this is. Monetary, this is the money supply. This is the velocity of money, meaning the number of times it turns over. 
This is the price level of society, and this is the quantity of output, the real output. So this is your GD, real GDP. This is how, much, how many things you're actually producing. This is the price level of those things. This is the velocity, how many times you turn over your dollar, and this is the money supply. So what that's saying is if you have one dollar, and it gets turned over four times, to have stable prices, you have a GDP of four dollars. Mm -hmm. Everything boils down to this simple formula. Mm -hmm. All right? And there's just basically the outline. Okay? So, in normal economics, you assume velocity is constant, right? So, what he's talking about is if you have velocity constant, if you have the real GDP remains the same, because printing money doesn't allow you to buy more corn, it doesn't allow you to produce more cars, right? If you print money and nothing changes with velocity or quantity, you get inflation. There is no doubt about that. I am 100% in agreement with that. Right? But what, we've, what have we heard about? We've heard about them printing money like mad. Mm -hmm. right? And there's no real inflation on an aggregate level. Food prices are going higher. Things that are purchased on the global market are going higher. But it's not due to the Fed. Many prices are going lower. And remember, inflation is an aggregate measure. You don't get to go pick and choose things that are going higher and say, see, the Fed's causing that, when many, many, many things are going through the floor. Right? Just a few months ago, they were talking about deflation. Right? So we're going to take a look at why is none of this stuff making any sense. All right, so you increase M, you increase P. That's what Glenn Beck's t telling you about. The problem is you don't get this, e this equation is a, a situation like you can put an economy in a test tube. In reality, velocity changes and quantity changes. All right? So what's the real theory? What do you really want to do? The Federal Reserve runs by something called a price rule. Right? They want to maintain stable prices. That's what everyone wants to do. Now, when you maintain stable prices to the Fed, that means slight inflation. Okay? The Fed deliberately creates slight inflation for a reason. All right? Because deflation is a whole heck of a lot worse. Okay? And I hope you ask about that later on as well. So the whole key, if you want to know what Ben Bernanke does for his entire living, he sits there and tries to figure out at what rate do you increase the money supply with a fixed velocity to have stable prices in a growing economy. So what do you do? If your economy grows at 2.5%, you grow your money supply at 2.5%, you have stable growth and stable prices. That's utopia. That's all Ben Bernanke tries to do, right? That's the monetarist theory of economics. That in a nutshell is Ben Bernanke, that in a nutshell is the Federal Reserve, that's what they're doing. But then you're asking, what's going on then? Why does the, you know, I keep hearing this stuff about the hyperinflation, the Weimar Republic, all this kind of stuff, the collapsing dollar, but none of it's happening. Well, we're going to get into why that's not happening. All right? Now, we're going to put it all together. And you're wondering, why do I have Obama on a bicycle? All right? Okay? And I'm not trying to humiliate President Obama. I want you to think about an analogy. When you're riding your bike, and you've got it in the highest gear, and all of a sudden that thing jumps a gear. You know, you got it in that 20 gear, and it jumps down that front gear to down to the lowest gear, suddenly what happens, right? You got two choices. You're either going to slow it, you're going to keep pedaling the same rate and go a lot slower, or you're really going to pick up your pedaling speed, right? Mm -hmm. There's a leveraging that goes on, right? Well, what you're seeing, I want you to think in terms of that, that analogy when, you, when that gear jumps, what do you do just to maintain the current speed, right? You have to speed up. Well. Here's what happened. Remember that MV equals PQ? Well, velocity dropped, jumped a gear. Velocity during this crisis suddenly took a huge drop down. Right? Now, you're Ben Bernanke, and your V just dropped. Right? Your V just dropped. What's that going to do? If you're Ben Bernanke, and you keep money the, the, the supply the same, your price level is going to drop, and your real output is going to drop. You go into a recession. You go into depression. Right? Right? You always hear about these people in the Depression taking their money and burying it in, a, in, a, in their yard, right? Well, if the money's buried in your yard, it can't be used for exchange. If you can't use it for exchange, nobody has any money to buy anything with. The economy tumbles. That's the Great Depression right here. All right? The other thing is we're in a fractional reserve system. Right? If I take $1, put it into the bank, you know, Ben Bernanke prints $1, puts it into the bank, that's a lot of money in the real economy because I take that dollar, I spend it, it gets put back in the bank, it gets spent, it gets put back in the bank, it gets spent, it gets put back in the bank. So $1 in the economy really can grow to about $10. Mm -hmm. 
So if you print $1, the money supply goes up by $10. There's a gearing going on. Well, what happened to the money multiplier? This is the money multiplier. We hit a crash and it jumped the gear again. So not only do you have the velocity dropping down, you have the money multiplier dropping down. So what are you gonna do if you're Ben Bernanke? You sit there and let the economy crash? Right, now you have money going down, you have velocity going down, price is gonna collapse, and quantity is gonna collapse. This is really the Great Depression, right? That's all that happened. And these are real numbers, you get them right off the Federal Reserve, okay? Now, if you're Ben Bernanke, what is the only thing you can do, <coughs> right? Ben Bernanke only controls one thing, the money supply, right? So I ask you, what are you gonna do? You're Ben Bernanke. Are you gonna sit there and allow this to happen? I know what I'm doing. I'm doing the only thing I can do. I'm printing this thing like mad, right? Because if I print this thing fast enough or get it big enough, I can reflate the economy so that we have stable, get the velocity going again. So we get to, let's hold the questions till the end. There'll be plenty of time for questions. Prices remain the same, quite a thing. That's what they did, all right? Now, this is what you're gonna see, and this is the kind of stuff that really inspired me to create this presentation. Because there's ways to make an argument that is honest but dishonest. Right? Every time I see them criticizing the Fed about printing the money, they show something called the monetary base. Right? The monetary base, and it shoots through the roof. I mean, it goes from about 800 mil mil million to over 2 trillion. And they show this and they say, the Federal Reserve's printing money like mad, you should be really scared. Right? The problem is, this is monetary base. This is the actual dollars. When they were printing all that money, most of it was going into safe deposit box at banks. It was like printing it, printing it and burying it in your, in your yard. It was recapitalizing the banks, right? So this is the money supply. Now remember, there's a money multiplier, and it shrunk. Well, this is doubled, but our money multiplier cut in half. So if I double something, if I go from a gear of 5 to 10, and then my back gear goes from one, uh, 2 to 1, what happens? I stay the same, right? So the pr Fed printed all this money to counter the collapsing of the velocity, and if you look at the money supply, which is really what's important, is it basically just reversed the collapse that was going on. This is why you're not seeing inflation overall, right? Because when you take a look at what happened to the money supply, they did print money, but the money supply, M1, that's out in currency and circulation, barely budged, all right? So even though they had this huge increase in dollars printed, the actual dollars being lent out by the banks increased very little. Right? And that's why you're not seeing runaway inflation. Now, Ben Bernanke, when he starts to see this get away, he will just pull the money back out that he injected. Okay? So that's what he's doing. He's going, increase them, and he's trying to get things stable again. To me, he's done a pretty good job. And that's why I hated to see everyone beating up on the guy. I'm saying, you know, every time I watch him make a move, I'm sitting there thinking, that's exactly what I would have done. You know, and all my friends are ripping him apart. Ripping him apart. So this is what he's doing. Increase them, stable uh, velocity, stable prices, increase Q. He's trying to reflate the economy so we can get the economy going. Now, the, the big issue is, though, if you really want to point the finger at someone to blame, it's the fiscal policy. The government has two, two policies. They have monetary policy and they have fiscal policy. The fiscal policy is creating uncertainty like mad, right? That's the real boogeyman, okay? If you want to really point the finger, Ben Bernanke's just <coughs> sitting there trying to do everything he can. Monetary policy is a very weak policy to do anything. It's not going to restore growth. You've got to give certainty to the business community so they can start feeling comfortable expanding. That comes from fiscal policy, but when you have uncertainty about taxes, when you have uncertainty about regulation, when you have uncertainty about um, Obamacare, when you have uncertainty about what's going to go on with the labor movements, it's very difficult for businesses to feel comfortable to expand. That's the issue and that's where we should be focused, not necessarily attacking the Fed. Um, now, Let's just take a look at some real numbers to, sh to show what I mean, because everyone's sitting there saying, I keep hearing this, but then the reality is this. Here is the uh, CPI. Now, there's different types of CPI. There's the core rate where they pull out food and energy, and everyone goes, why would you do that? And then there's the, 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 the basically just the normal CPI that does have food and energy. And you can see that they're, they're relatively volatile if you add food and energy in it, but overall they tend to, to trend the same. The point being, though, is here's when they printed the money right here, Okay, I lined up the arrows. They started printing money and the CPI fell through the floor. That doesn't make any sense if you stick with the normal theory, right? This shows you there's a collapse in the system. If you can start printing money, you don't get hyperinflation, you get the exact opposite. 
If you understand MV equals PQ, that makes sense now. All right, the other one is, um, here you have, um, this is, these are commodities. All right, once again, I believe this is oil. They started printing money like mad, and what happened to the price of oil? Collapsed, all right? So once again, they printed money, and you didn't get inflation, you got deflation because of that gearing mechanism that I'm referring to. Okay, here's the dollar, okay? Here's where they started printing money. Here's where it is today. That's above here. They printed all this money, and the dollar is a trade-weighted dollar actually increased. So once again, everything you hear when you actually do the homework and look into the numbers, it's not making any sense, all right? But it makes sense if you understand what the Fed is actually doing. And the charts themselves, to me, prove that they're doing a pretty doggone good job. The other thing is, if you remember back in 2007, everything was going through the roof. Here are, here's agriculture, okay? Here's where we are today. Here's where agriculture was back in 2007 before we printed all this money. Prices are way lower on agriculture. So even though food has started to increase, they're still way below where they were in 2007 before the money was, the money was, uh, money, money was printed. And if the money was printed after this peak, the money couldn't be causing the inflation back here. Right? Same thing, this is natural gas. Natural gas has fallen through the floor. This is, um, uh, what is this, livestock. This is livestock, it's much cheaper. And this is grains. Everything is below the 2007 peak, and it's at, occurred after, the money printing occurred after 2007. All right? The other thing that you'll hear about is the Federal Reserve controls interest rates. Right? They're responsible for the mortgage crisis and things like that. The Fed controls the very, very, very short end, the overnight loans. Matter of fact, when they came out with QE3, or QE2, QE2 is supposed to do what? Get the interest rates down at the 10-year, right? They're going to start buying the 10-year and suppress interest rates on the long end. Well, here's where they started talking about it at Jackson Hole. This is where they actually started to implement it, and this is where it is now. The Fed started to buy the 10-year and interest rates increased doing exactly opposite QE2 not suppressing interest rates. So the Federal Reserve does not control interest rates. <coughs> the market itself is proving that. They do control the overnight rate, okay? But that's a huge difference from the mortgage rates, which is where the crisis occurred, right? This is the CRB. Once again, here's QE1, okay? This is, this is, this is where we were before they started printing money. This is where we are after they started printing money. This is where we are today, and that's after QE1 and QE2. QE1 is quantitative <coughs> easing. Um, it just means they're literally printing money. All right? <clears throat> Same thing with the dollar. The dollar is actually stronger than when they started printing all this money. Those are just simply objective facts. And so what I did is you know, I wanted to take a look at these and make sure that everyone is aware of that, because if you go and talk to someone in the financial world, uh, you go to talk to the newspapers, they're going to take your quote about the dollar collapsing, and they're going to put the dollar chart and they're going to say, you know, and especially they're going to pick this thing right here and say, there's no truth to what's being said. The other thing is, we're way below the low. Okay? If, you are, if you're going to call the collapse of the dollar, the one requirement is for you to take out the low. You haven't even come close to that. You're going in the exact opposite direction. And I'm willing to argue, bet in another two years, if you have me back, the dollar will be much stronger. This is the real problem. This is if we want to really, if we really want to get out the pitchforks and direct it where the hostility belongs, it's this, the debt. Okay? There's another big mistake. The Fed does not run up the debt. Period. The Fed is a bank. It makes loans. Congress spends money. The Fed does not spend money. All right? And that's a huge mistake. And if you take a look at it, the national debt, if you count for the unfunded and the funded liabilities, it's $112 trillion, okay? Now they'll say the Fed's responsible for that. Well, that's easy to check, all right? The Fed has a balance sheet that you can go audit. And if you take a look at the Fed, the Fed owns, used to own less than a trillion dollars in debt. The debt is 100 trillion, they own less than 1%, all right? The real owners of the debt, the real people responsible for funding or fueling everything, the fueling debt is the, U.S. government, Social Security buys our debt like mad, right? Next one is the U.S. citizens. You and I buy a lot of debt with our, um, our mutual funds. Japan, the Chinese, okay? So if you want to take a look at who really funds the debt, the Federal Reserve is a relatively minor player, right? So the Fed is not responsible for the debt. The Fed makes loans. 
Now, this is, this is another thing that caught my eye. I mean, say, I've got to step up and do something about it. Is if you ever watch that Fiat Empire, right? They start out with this quote. And when I saw this, I about fell off my chair, right? And so I have a little thing here. I will give it, I'm sure we all have our pocket constitutions. Before the end of the show, if anyone can find this quote, the basis for this anti Fed movie, if you can find this quote in the U.S. Constitution in completeness, this entire thing all at once, okay, no breaking up, picking word from here to there, I'll give you a million dollars. Right? <laughs> but the entire foundation of that movie is the misquoting of the U.S. Constitution and misrepresentation. And when I see this kind of stuff that's so easy to prove is a myth, you don't want to go in front of the Fred or the, the press making those kind of comments. Right? Now, this is the other concern I've got. We have the we are the reserve currency of the world. All right? Now, what that means is everything in the global market is priced in U.S. dollars. So when you talk about competing currencies, the world can choose anything they want for their reserve currency. And they've chosen the U.S. dollar. So while many people don't have a lot of faith in the Fed here in the United States, the entire world, through their own actions, proves that they really like what the Fed does. They have, they have made the U.S. dollar the standard <coughs> for the world. And that is something to me we should cherish, because I can tell you one thing. Good old Hugh here, he's over there going, oh, please, end the Fed, end the Fed, because I would love my renminbi to be the world's reserve currency. It's a huge advantage, and if we did end the Fed, we would be surrendering one of our greatest economic advantages that we have. Okay? Um, the other thing is, <clears throat> we're talking about, you know, the dollar is too strong. I hear these comments like the dollar is too strong. Well, the way you determine whether a dollar is too strong or not is whether you have a trade deficit or not. Well, we have huge trade deficits, which by definition means your dollar, even after printing money, is still too strong. The Chinese literally, and I've seen some estimates as high as 40%, undervalue their currency by 40%. Okay? The China, there's a huge benefit to having a weak currency. You suddenly dominate the global markets, right? And so the countries literally devalue their currency relative to us to have access to our markets. We're over there telling, wait a minute, we're over there saying to you, say, hey, would you win? You got to increase the value of your dollar. We need to weaken our dollar versus the Chinese. That's what we should be doing. That, to me, is a legitimate way to go about handling the trade deficit issue. Um, once again, they hit the thing. Um, the other thing is, you know, talking about the Fed causing all this debt or using taxpayers' dollars. It doesn't. The Fed pays the um, the um, treasury. Fed pays U.S. Treasury record hundred billion dollars last year. The Fed makes money. Okay, it doesn't cost you money, right? And this is the one that, I don't know if you heard me, two years ago I was on Dirt Show, when all this tarp hit. And everyone kept saying, we're spending all this money, it's going to bankrupt the state. And I'm going, what are you, we can't be saying that. So I immediately got on Dirt Show so that I could say, look, that's not what's going on. The Fed is a bank. They make loans. But these are, these are the headlines. Tracking the $700 billion bailout. It wasn't a bailout. It was never a bailout. It was a loan during a crisis. Okay, those loans get paid back. So now when you see it, gas for the, the government is making money on TARP. We didn't spend $700 billion. We preserved the economy so we should act, we could actually make money. We actually bought low and sell high. That's what I tell every investor in the world. Take advantage of the situation if you can. TARP bailouts, bailout to cost less than anticipated. We will probably make money on TARP. Now, the, the point there is it didn't cost us $700 billion, but if we listen to the people who were telling us it was going to cost $700 billion, We'd be in real trouble right now. Luckily, they did the right thing. The Fed is the lender of last resort. That's what they were created for. They were created to force, step in and say, okay, you guys are about to die. You know, uh, beating up on the Fed is like beating up on the ER doc for saving a person that, for drunk driving. You know, he's not responsible for drunk driving. He's just trying to keep the patient alive long enough to get things rolling again. But TARP will actually make us money. TARP was something we should, in my eyes, we should have been supporting. And I saw my friends tearing it apart. I'm going, wait a minute, you guys don't know what you're doing. You want to repeat the depression? Um, you want to do it. But just keep an eye, you'll see tarp, tarp thing. The other thing is explosive food. Food is going through the roof. Absolutely no argument there. But it's not going up through the roof because of anything the Fed's doing. It's going through the roof because, as all the headlines will point out, we're changing. The, the global economy is picking up. China has 1.2 billion people, and they're starting to eat a lot of breakfast cereals. Okay? India is coming up, you know? The world is growing. You know, it used to be just us, 300 million people dominating the world economy. Now we're competing for those grains. So when you read these arguments or these uh, articles about explosive food prices, they never even mention the Fed. 
They say Brazil, Russia, India, China, the explosive growth overseas. Global food chains stretch the limit. This is demand-driven inflation. There's different types of inflation. This is demand-driven, and there is nothing we can do to change what's going to happen overseas when they start buying. There is nothing we, the Fed is not responsible when OPEC cuts back the oil supply and the price of oil goes through the roof. That's a different type, that's a supply shock inflation. Okay, there's demand driven inflation. Monetary inflation is what the Fed causes and we don't have monetary inflation. So if you say, Bob, there's inflation in the food, I say, yeah, there, exactly there is. But we can't do anything about the growth in India and China and, and Brazil and, and, and Russia. All right? The other thing is, you know, I've heard these arguments that deflation is good. Okay, deflation is awful, all right? Um, and I, I'm not gonna go too much into that. I hope someone asks questions about it. But ask anyone who's lived through the depression if they think deflation is a good deal. We had deflation during the, the Great Depression. Ask anyone who runs a business and suddenly the price of their product falls through the floor and their amount of debt remains the same and their payments remain the same. Suddenly you've got to sell a whole heck of a lot more just to make that debt payment when you're experiencing deflation. Inflation you can pass on to the consumer. This is a famous quote when they always say the US dollar lost 95% since it was printed. That's not, it's not even close to accurate if, if you deal with it in the real world. That's only true if you take a dollar back in 1913 and bury it in the sand, pull it back out 100 years later. Nobody does that. They put it in the bank that returns interest. Um, and here, here's an example, minimum wage. You know, they're talk the other thing is you have to put the, the, the prices in shape. Now, why do you want inflation over time? And people keep saying, well, the dollar's worth so much less, okay? Well, how would you, how would you give an example for that? You don't really put things in terms of what the dollar's worth, okay? What you do is you put in, let's say, a, a, a percentage of your income. Now, back in 1953, a minimum wage was 75 cents, all right? Now, after inflation, you're being paid a lot more, okay? But 75 cents back then, 15 cent burgers, would buy you five hamburgers. <coughs> so one hour of work buys you five hamburgers. Today, Minimum wage is 725, and that'll buy you 7.25 double cheeseburgers. So clearly, even with inflation, your standard of living is much higher. And standard of living is what you're concerned with, not necessarily the value of the dollar over extended periods of time. The key is to maintain have a monetary policy that stimulates growth so that everything increases at the same rate, so the standard of living continues to grow. You don't want to have these huge business cycles where one day you're booming. The next day, you're in depression for five or six years. Um, I'm just going to now. I'm just going to hit some slides to generate uh, questions. Um, world billionaires. People keep talking about foreign bankers owning the Fed and stuff like that. No. Okay. Um, nobody owns the Fed. Members banks officially own the Fed, but it's basically just an accounting entry. And the way I prove it, that there's not these individuals that own the Federal Reserve, which, by the way, some of the early central banks you did have private owners. Um, so I understand where the myth came from. If I was the owner of the Fed, what's the first thing you would do? I would print, I would say, hey, Charlie, fire up that printing press and put all that money in my checking account, right? That's what I would do, right? Well, go take a look at the world billionaires, right? You'll see Bill Gates, Warren Buffett, Carlos Slim. You will not see anybody labeled as owner of the Federal Reserve. And yet if you were the owner of the Federal Reserve, I guarantee you, you would be a multi, multi, multi-trillionaire Overnight, okay. Um, another way is if the if the stock if the Federal Reserve is truly a private company owned by people, find a quote for it on the New York Stock Exchange or any stock exchange. You can't buy stock in the New York Stock Exchange. Um, the other thing is is the Fed audited. The Fed is audited by numerous facilities. Okay, you can audit the Fed yourself. Just go to the Federal Reserve and here's their balance sheet. You can go take this up to the Cleveland Federal Reserve and say, show me where you have all this. The Federal Reserve is audited. When they're talking about auditing the Federal Reserve, they're talking about auditing their decision-making processes or the monetary policy. The Federal Reserve was created to be independent for a reason. You don't want Nancy Pelosi controlling the printing presses. That's why the Federal Reserve was set up the way it was. Okay, so when they're talking about auditing the Federal Reserve, they're not talking about looking at the books. You can do that. They do it all the time. Congress has, uh, uh, Congress audits it. There's congressional testimony, all kinds. Of, what they're talking about now is putting political pressure on the monetary policy. In my book, that is 
the worst thing you could do. The reason we have such credibility is because we don't have a politicized Fed. If you want to see a politicized Fed, look at Zimbabwe. That's very dangerous. And the Fed, thankfully, they were smart enough when they created it to say, there's no way we can trust Congress with this responsibility. Make them quasi-independent. Right? There's also a lot of attacks on the banking system. We don't need the banking system when the bankers are bad. The bankers are essential for a free market system to thrive. Right? The, bank, the, the banking system allows individuals like you and me to enjoy the benefits of capitalism. We get our student loans, we get farm loans, we get auto loans, we get home loans, business loans. Okay, the banking system is critical. And so you can see when the business, when the banking system collapses, I always think of the banking system as like the operating system of a computer, right? And the, so I don't, it's not really a part of the free market system, it's the enabler of the free market system. <coughs> You know, if you can let GM collapse, you can let Enron collapse, you can let all these different corporations collapse, and er the damage is always contained. If you let the banking system collapse, every system collapses, every business collapses. Okay, and that was the lesson of the Great Depression. Um, the other thing, the other example on how I can show you that the Fed isn't responsible for the debt, okay? China races to bail out the pigs. The pigs, Portugal, Italy, Ireland, Greece, and Spain, they don't, have a federal, they don't have a central bank, and yet they're buried in debt, okay? You can spend a whole heck of a lot of money that you don't own without a central bank or a Federal Reserve. The states, we're seeing that here in the state. Ohio has no control over what the Federal Reserve do does, but we buried ourselves in debt. You don't need a Federal Reserve to dig yourself in debt, all right? As far as inflation goes, I'm going to skip that. Um, and that's about, that's about it as far as the, uh, the, the, the uh, presentation, just to start throwing some questions out, or hopefully generate some ideas. All right, any, any questions? Yeah, I think the Fed counterfeits money. I don't, my grandchild cannot do that. Well, uh, there is a basis of counterfeiting money by trillions and trillions, and the Fed creates the booms and busts. If you control a money supply, if I give my child some money, and and we do that as private people, we tend to do that. But you cannot have a entity in the world as big as the Fed that really, and the Fed has passed most of their powers onto International Monetary Fund. And okay. so, in the Fed is what I say. I'm with Ron Paul and the Tea Party people, and I really believe that. I this is crap. I'm here. Okay. To, well, I, I expected that. Okay, here's the other way I address that. Right now we have the world reserve currency. We have a Federal Reserve that has successfully navigated a, a situation that in the past had resulted in the Great Depression. And we're going to end the Federal Reserve. That's, that's the slogan I hear. Let's go end the Fed. Let's grab the pitchforks and go end the Fed. What are we going to end the Fed with that will be superior to the system we've got? One thing is get get back to where it's backed by gold or silver or something, intrinsic value. Work is what we do in life, and we get paid for our work. Uh, it started out as a barter system way back, and after that it went to uh, the fractional reserve, where they only have to have so much money in a bank. Mm -hmm. They don't have, it's just paper. This is just phony paper we've got in our pocket that the Federal Reserve creates in Vietnam, in all these places. These, these, when you give aid to all the countries in the world, where does this money come from? The federal government is bankrupt. It has no money. Well, that is true. I mean, but, but once again, that's the, that's the Treasury or that's Congress raising money to give it. That's not the Fed printing. Now, that, that raises a good point about the gold standard, all right? Now, we've been on a gold standard before, mm -hmm. all right? And we got off of it for a reason. Gold is what you call an inelastic um, currency, meaning that it doesn't change with economic growth. So what you do with the gold standard is you fix the gold supply and the economy adjusts to the gold supply, right? And so that's why you have these tremendous booms and busts during a gold cycle, especially when there's a panic and everyone grabbed their gold and buried it, it would kill the economy. So if you look at the period before the Federal Reserve of 1913, you saw that we went through routine cycles of depressions, booms and busts, that term booms and busts comes from the pre-Federal Reserve gold standard era. The Federal Reserve and the fiat standard, 
what you're talking about, is what's called an elastic currency. When I had that MV equals PQ, we're allowed to print money so that money supply increases at the same rate of growth. So it smooths out the business cycle. That's the whole key concept. Now we could go back to a gold standard. However, if you go back to a gold standard, who becomes our Federal Reserve? South Africa, Russia, and Canada. Those are the major oil or gold producers. Suddenly, we would be turning our gold, our money supply over to foreigners. So, if you really want foreign foreign bankers, you'd go back to a gold supply. Well, I had understood years ago that the uh, gold uh, <coughs> prices are set by five individuals in one or in England. Is this true or not? Uh, not for our not not for our currency. That's the, that's another good example. Whenever they're talking about the gold standard. You got to remember, if you don't want the government to control things, the government gets to stamp the value on that coin. Okay? The, if the government wants to print money under a gold standard, all they do is revalue that gold. It happens all the time. So every problem you have with the gold sta with the fiat standard, you have with the gold <coughs> standard, and then some. The fiat standard is simply an improvement upon the gold standard, but you still have the same problems with the gold standard or not. I have a question to ask, or maybe a statement to make. So the coins that are printed, the coins that are minted, the differential between the coin cost to mint and the value goes to the U.S. Treasury. The difference between the paper costs that the Fed pays the Treasury for printing the money, our Treasury does print the money, it does collect for printing the money, but the seniorage, the difference, between the printed value and the actual value, if it's a $1,000 bill or a $50 bill or whatever, the last time I heard, it costs about a nickel to print a paper bill. Sure. The difference comes into our economy as debt. That seniorage goes to the Federal Reserve, and we pay interest on this debt, and this is why you have the comment that they print this out of thin air. They pay very little for the paper money, but the actual value that comes into debt in the system, we pay interest on, and that interest goes to the Federal Reserve. That's, that's, well, no, the interest doesn't go to the Federal Reserve. Any interest the Federal Reserve would get, it turns over to the Treasury. But what you're pointing there is a fiat standard. Let me say this. Don't believe anything I say. Check this out on what seniorage is, and if people understand that, they'll understand why. If the interest goes to the Treasury, then we wouldn't need the, the Federal Reserve per se. If all of the interest on all of the debt money that has been printed over the 100 years, close to 100 years, this debt that we have would be non-existent. Okay, if you, if you take- and the 10th Amendment will save our country. Yeah. If, you take, if yeah. you take a look at the Fed's balance sheet, what you'll see that they hold are US government bonds. That's what they hold. So when they print money, they're buying, they inject money into the economy by buying government bonds. And so those government bonds do pay the Federal Reserve interest, but that Federal Reserve, that interest gets paid back to the Treasury. They, the, the Federal Reserve just has a reserve of, of Treasury bonds to support the currency. I mean, that's, but you can say, look up, what was the term you used? Check, 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 check out, check it out for yourself. Senior, senior, senior. 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 Okay, Joe. Uh, I think you were uh, just describing something called monetizing the debt. Monetizing the debt, yeah. So, uh, you know, if the Fed is buying, you know, our government bonds or whatever, monetizing the debt, where, where does the Fed get the money to buy those bonds? Does it have it in a vault in the basement? Okay. Now, remember MV <laughs> equals PQ. There, this is growing at the rate of Q. This is growing at a nice rate. This is monetizing the debt. You normally don't monetize the debt. This is an emergency situation, okay? So when they're talking about monetizing the debt, they are monetizing the debt, but it's to offset the collapse here so that it all nets out the same. It's like, like I said, shifting gears on a bicycle. Yeah, I have a question. Glenn Beck, when he's, you know, giving his little commercials for the gold and stuff, he says that he buys coins mm -hmm. because apparently back in FDR's day, yeah. People were told to turn in their gold. Can you yep. go over that story a little bit? There's now? another great. There's another great example um, on why I say a gold standard is going to have every problem with a fiat standard and then some. FDR, we were on a gold standard up until um, FDR. Well, when they found out the economy is collapsing and you find out that the gold, the the, the uh, gold standard is literally a collar around the free market system. 
They went off it, so what does the government do? It just simply says, turn in your gold, and then we're going to do anything we want with monetary policy. Remember that Congress has the power to coin money. They're allowed to do whatever they want. The way that they figured out how to run the monetary policy was with a Federal Reserve. You know, they come out and they said, you know, Article 1, Section 8, it, you know, they're allowed to do it. They're allowed to coin money. They said the way we're going to do this is with a Federal Reserve. But why was the Reserve Act passed in the middle of the night in December, like our Health Care Act was bribed by the, all of these bad government exactly. bills? Exactly. Right, exactly. Did anyone hear me on, uh, did, when I was on Dirks' show a few weeks ago, did, did you hear that? Did you hear, did anyone say hear that? Well, that quote was someone called in with that quote. So Dirk immediately got on the Google to find out where that came from. That, that's a myth. It's just simply a myth. Um, uh, it, and matter of fact, if you go to the meetup posting for this, I went and I posted a uh, link to a professor that's gone and addressed all these myths about the Federal Reserve. I don't want to get into all of them, um, but if you go there, it's at least a good source to read to understand about this passing in the middle of the night, things like that. The facts are we have a Federal Reserve. The facts are since the Federal Reserve, we've had one depression. Facts are, go back and look at the previous 100 years, there were depressions all the time. Since then, they had one really bad time in the Great Depression where they did not perform their role as a lender of last resort. We got the Great Depression. Hopefully, we learned from it. And that's why we've had the crash of 87, we've had the crash of 2007, and we haven't had a major depression since then. Give that. Um, good. Yeah. Uh, is one of the responsibilities of the Fed to control unemployment? And then I will follow up to that. Good, good question. Okay. The Fed has what's called a dual mandate. Now, if you really want to start saying we've got to change some things, the dual mandate came in the 1970s. Originally, the Federal Reserve was set up to, with one standard, you maintain inflation. In the 70s, they came along and said, okay, you're going to have a dual mandate. You're going to maintain low unemployment. So right now, the Fed is walking this tightrope. Right? They got unemployment here, and they and they got they got inflation here. And the problem is low inflation, low unemployment is coincident with low unemployment. So they literally have to fight themselves. They have two conflicting objectives. Now, if we really want to get serious, we would say knock off this dual mandate stuff. You set them up for failure. You know, we give them this, this set of rules, they go execute their set of rules, and then when it fails, we blame the Fed. When we really would say, why are you telling them to do two things that you know work against themselves? We should get back to have the fiscal policy responsible for the unemployment and the Federal Reserve for price stability. That's a great solution. Um, perhaps TARP, or let's, go, let's get to TARP here for a second. Perhaps TARP was uh, maybe short term beneficial. Um, but is it really a good trade off for the government uh, being able to leverage power over these companies that receive the TARP money? Great, great, great question. And also, um, what about who chooses which companies get this money, who, which companies live and die? That is a great question. All right. Now remember, when I'm talking, I am talking about the Federal Reserve and the banking system. There is a lot of things in TARP that I totally disagree with. Their interference with GM, um, when, they, when they strayed from the banking system. But remember, TARP is the troubled asset reserve. It came out of the Treasury. Right? It, wasn't necessarily, it wasn't necessarily a Federal Reserve thing. I'm talking about the Federal Reserve's role in TARP, not what they do with GM. GM, I totally, totally disagree with. Uh, they violated the property rights of the bondholders. They, they increased the risk of corporate bonds worldwide. They, treaded, they, they violated commonly accepted principles that will, pay, that will have huge consequences going forward because now what are you thinking as someone investing in one of our corporations? Is the government going to step in and violate my property rights? That's an issue we should be getting the pitchforks about, not with the Fed did. So what you're saying is uh, maybe TARP was more beneficial in terms of what it was doing with the banks and not so much with private companies. Yeah, the Federal Reserve has a role. Our federal government has a role in ensuring that the banking system is stable. They're the, they, they create the money. They create the regulations. It's their responsibility to make sure that the banking system remains smooth and functioning. You know, they've got to promote the general welfare. Well, the way that they're doing that is with a stable currency and a stable banking system allows everybody to thrive. It, once again, the banking system is like the heart of an individual or the operating of a, of a computer, operating system of a computer. If you let the banking system die, we all die. Alicia. Um, one of the things that jumped out at me on your slide was student loans. Yep. And that is one of the things that was included in the health care bill 
that the government is now taking over student loans. What's the deal with that? This is where, this is where I would argue is not a legitimate role of the federal government. When they get into Fannie and Freddie, Okay, if you want to take a look at what really caused this, cra this crash, it was Fannie and Freddie getting in, and they separated the risk between the lenders and the risk. The, the, they, they, they severed the risk taker from the risk lender. And so if you're a mortgage lender, and some guy shows up to you without a job, right, and you know that if I can just sign this, this mortgage, I can immediately package that and sell the bond out to some sucker, do I have any incentive whatsoever to worry about his credit rating? No. no. That is corruption that will bring up the free market system to its knees and that is really bad that however was fannie and freddie not the fed that's the long end of the curve right. and that's the stuff that you got to knock off because when, when, anytime you separate the the, the, the uh, reward from the risk taker it breaks down the system simply breaks down so you had all these people just writing these mortgages going i just want this uh underwriting fee so i can se sell my bond off to some oh, sucker right. And when those, those bonds sank, those banks were the reserve, those mortgages were the reserves of banks. And when they sunk down, they could no longer lend you money so that you could run your business or, or buy your car or things like that. That's how you bring an economy to its knees. That, I mean, eliminate Fannie and Freddie, eliminate Sally Mae, eliminate those kind of tamperings in the free market. What's going to happen when the U.S. dollar is not the world reserve currency next week, next month, next year? Okay. If we keep knocking the Fed, if we ever politicize the Fed, if we end the Fed, we'll find out real quick, and the cost of borrowing and the cost of purchasing things on the global market will shoot through the roof. Right? Ending the Fed would result in us immediately losing the world reserve currency status. My argument is, we're being, I mean, this is like, um, you know, you, you don't know what you've got until it's gone. If we, take, if we keep giving the world the reason to doubt our Fed and beating up on it and threatening it, and the rest of those people over in China are saying, look, those guys in America, they don't know what they're doing. Let's use the renminbi for the world reserve currency. Then we'll find out. My, my argument is, though, we've got to do everything we can to make sure we remain the reserve currency. Hi, um, you did mention that the creators of the debt were first the U.S. government, second the... Uh, owners. Okay, owners. And then you said third, way down on that graph, you had China. And I've been hearing, whether it's true or not, and I would like you to elaborate a little bit more, that... Everywhere we go, we hear China holds the majority of our debt. So that's why I okay. saying the chart's wrong, but it seems to me that's not what's in the news. Yeah, you got it. You got it. Whenever you hear that, you have to look very carefully to what they're saying. They're saying the private ownership of the debt. Okay, the biggest owner of your debt is your your Social Security and Medicare accounts. All right. Every time you pay your Social Security tax. You know, they always say, they always say Social Security is running a surplus. Well, that surplus goes into buying our government bonds. That's why it's a Ponzi scheme. Okay, if you really want to get upset, get, take a look at the accounting of Social Security and Medicare. That's, that's a pitchfork issue. Okay, the U.S. citizens are number two. Okay, and you can see most of us own government bonds in our mutual funds and pension and retirement accounts. When you take a look at the state of Ohio, their pension, I guarantee, has a lot of treasury bonds. I used to manage a, a government bond fund. Okay. Here, way down here at 800 million before TARP 1 is the Federal Reserve, then Japan. So if you remove, if you remove all the U.S. buyers, China becomes the largest foreign owner of our debt by far. Okay, you got China, or actually I take that back. Japan first, then China. Okay, but it's growing. Now the reason they have so many of our bonds is because we buy their goods. Okay, the reason you have, what happens when you have a trade deficit is we go over and we buy goods from, from you can do two things with a dollar, right? You can consume it, spend it, or you can save it, right? A trade deficit means that we go over and we buy goods from China, and what do they do with that dollar that we just used to buy their goods? They turn around and buy what? <coughs> Not our goods, they buy our bonds, okay? So anytime you see a country with a trade deficit, they're going to be big holders of our bonds because that's what they buy with their bonds afterwards. I noticed you had a slide on there from the Mises Institute. Yeah. Uh, was uh, Ludwig von Mises right or wrong? Uh, I'm a big fan of Road to Serfdom. And you won't see Federal Reserve mentioned in Road to Serfdom at all. Matter of fact, Road to, Road to Serfdom is one of the books that got me on the path to becoming, uh, uh, getting my master's in economics. So that is the path to socialism. 
Socialism is spending beyond your means. That socialism is robbing the individual of, of self integrity and, and, and the work ethic. That's that. That's what we're all. That's what I hope we're all about is getting back to you know individual responsibility, self dependency, things like that. Um, that's what that's what road to surfing is to me. So, Mike. All right. Um, speaking of socialism, I have a little book here called the Communist Manifesto. Yeah. And in it, it lists 10 planks for the socialization of a society or a country. And plank number five is the centralization of credit in the hands of the state by means of a national bank of state capital and an exclusive monopoly. And when was that written? The Communist Manifesto? Yeah. Late, mid 1840. When was the Constitution written? 1776. Okay. Our founding fathers had a central bank. I mean, the key is they just because just because started. just because they came up with it doesn't mean. Bottom line is they came up with it after they saw the success we had with here in the U.S. I mean, the bottom line is our founding fathers were first. Um, and bottom line is the federal government somehow have almost always coined money. I mean, the, the British pound used to be the the currency of the world. Um, money is different from printing bay backless paper notes. I mean, and I, this book right here, the American government, 1912. At that time, this, this book describes this process where you could actually bring in your gold and silver and the government would press mm -hmm. coins for you. That's how it started. And it would, it, with the treasury, and there was no Federal Reserve. And at the time this book was published, the, America was not a wasteland or a barren outpost. There, there were over half, half a million government employees, and the American system was thriving all the way up to that. And, and you're right, but, but once again, the, the Constitution does not dictate how you are to coin money. It doesn't dictate what money is or what... I mean, it, it, it simply says that the, the federal government has the power to coin money and regulate the value thereof. Well, that's, that's it. That's what Since doing. then, the Congress has had the right to interpret how do you administer that power. Who runs the Fed? Who, is, who has run the Fed almost since inception? What's the organization? You tell me. Um, how about you tell me and we'll start the conversation? <laughs> the Council of Foreign Relations. Council of Foreign Relations, okay? Okay. Who runs the Federal Reserve is Ben Bernanke, and he is nominated by the President and confirmed by the Congress. That's who runs the Federal Reserve. He has clearly stated objectives. He has a dual mandate of low, low unemployment and low inflation. When things go wrong, like they did with the mortgage crisis, the Fed has to step in to resuscitate the economy. But the analogy is, is like that ER doc trying to resuscitate that drunk driver. Don't beat up on the, the ER doc because of what the drunk driver did. The Federal Reserve steps in after the damage is done. It's not causing the damage. If you want to point the finger where the damage is, look at what caused the damage, and that was the mortgage crisis. My question is, the Federal Reserve has been headed up by Council of Foreign Relations since 1929 and before, and I got a list of them right here. Anybody afterwards wants to see it? Anybody wants to know about the Council of Foreign Relations, if they haven't heard about it, it is the power elite in this country, as it is like the Trilateral Commission, maybe some of you have heard of like those type of people, and you counterfeit money, and what you, you cannot counterfeit money, and like Michael said, Michael got, he's got it straight, this Michael right here, and uh, he, he's researched this stuff, he's a young guy, and uh, I've been with the John Burt Society since uh, way back, at probably 45 years now. And uh, we've been, 1958 was when we were founded. And if you control the money supply and the military, you control a country. And you cannot counterfeit money. Jim Jordan is my congressman, the 4th District. I'm, I'm, from, I'm the baloney guy up at Waldo. And Jim Jordan was voting only 67% constitutional when he got in office. Sue and I, I really urge you to get on the John Burt Society website because they have alerts on on all this stuff. There's all kinds. This, I want to know. Well, hold on a second. Let me, let me take a few thing. more questions real just, quick. Just one we're thing. have to talk at the end because yeah. we're going to have okay, to. Okay. Um, I wanted to revisit the, the business with the, our banks. Were not our banks threatened, coerced, and people showing up at their doors to make them make these loans. Yes, that, that is how you bring the system to its knees. You want to have a bank. So our banks are to blame. 
<coughs> if you have Acorn, well, you see it right now with the union showing up at the legislator's right. doors. If right. you have Acorn showing up at a, a mortgage lender's home, threatening his children, he's probably going to make some irrational decisions. The key is when they package those bonds and an investor buys that bond, they have to be able to analyze the risk. Everything in the financial world is based upon risk and return, right? The moment that broke down, the entire system broke down. Um, no, you, once you lose trust in the financial system, it is literally a horse of cards. Nobody will lend to you. Nobody will borrow. You can't make your payments because the bank won't lend you, and you shut down. Well, uh, that brings another thing uh, to the individual. Do you know what a QCIP is? is well, it's our, our value of the day we're born and then on for every marriage license and everything else we do in public. I'm sure you I would say that education is the key, so how do we simplify it to take care of 30-second soundbite in YouTube moments <laughs> and make it simple? A child is taught that he asks for something, he gets it, instead of this is what you got to do. And now that you've got it, this is what you have to pay back. Mm -hmm. How do we set aside a simple educational comic book? I don't know, but that, that, those are the, that's the challenges we, we face today. I mean, I'm just looking back at my life and the dramatic changes, the lack, the, the lack of individual responsibility, uh, self-reliance, the work ethics. Um, I used to make my money cutting lawns. No one's ever, but barely ever even come up to ask me to cut a lawn. An 18-year-old cannot do change. Yeah, they can't. Our educational system, you can graduate without being able to do basic math. Well, they I mean, can't even spell I, service or soldier in the eighth grade. Yeah. I had that personal experience yeah. two weeks ago. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, uh, this I'd like to speak after him, but he's had his hand up for, since the very beginning. Go ahead. Go ahead. Be Sorry about that. Several times I've heard you make the statement that Congress can do whatever it wants to do and it can interpret anything it wants to any way it wants to. Can you please give me the site? Did I say that? Did anyone hear me say that, by the way? No. I don't think, I guarantee you, I didn't say that. I would say you're, the Congress is pretty well constrained by this. Article 1, Section 8 prints out what the Congress can do. And what I'm referring to is when I say the Federal Reserve or the Congress can do what they want to do with coining money, it's because they're given the power to coin money and regulate the value thereof. That means when you say regulate the value of money. It's done in the purview of the Constitution. Right. And if I can I got finish right my question, you obviously you don't want to hear the question. I'm listening. You've made the statement. I would like you to cite the Supreme Court ruling that overturned Marbury versus Madison. Can't do it. I can tell you right now that the system that we have right now has been tried in, in the uh, Supreme Court quite often. We have, I mean, the bottom line is, when you're making those kind of comments, you're treating the Constitution as if it is an instruction manual. It does not tell the Congress how it can exercise those problems. It says the Congress can go to war. It doesn't say how you have to do it. It says you can coin money. You can regulate the value of thereof. It doesn't say, but you have to do it with a Federal Reserve, or you have to do it with a gold standard, or you have to do it this way. No, you're reading in the Constitution say, things that don't exist. What it does says is they can make them to quote Marbury versus Madison, any act of the legislature that's repugnant to the Constitution is void. And there's many acts of the Congress that have been made that are in repugnant to the Constitution, which makes them void, but they're still upheld by the de facto government as if they weren't void. All right, I'll give you everything. What do we want to replace the Federal Reserve with? Find me a better how about, solution how about than the Federal Reserve. Reserve. That's what? right. How about U.S. Treasury notes? Yep. Okay, that. okay, that's a good idea. Let's use U.S. Treasury notes. That's what you're saying? Yeah. Okay, who issues U.S. Treasury notes? Treasury. The Treasury. Who controls Treasury? Congress. Congress. Do you honestly want Nancy Pelosi printing money anytime she wants a spending project? No, no, no. That's what you just said. They're assuming that the Congress can legislate into action some responsible body with, op, uh, with elected officials that are operating that section of the Treasury. What do you think the Federal Treasury? Reserve is? Let them finish. Let them finish. How many elected officials sit on the Federal Reserve Board? Zero. None. Well, well the, it depends on who. They are not many elected officials sit on the Federal Reserve Board. Anywhere. Any 
show me one elected official that has anything anywhere to do with the Federal Reserve. It is not part of our government. They, they are nominated by our elected officials. They are approved by our elected officials. But what you just said there is exactly how they reached the conclusion that we need a Federal Reserve. They sat there and said, why don't we issue these Treasury notes? Well, if we do that, how do we create it so that Congress can't control it? Well, we'll set it up as an independent body. If we set it up as an independent body, then we have to nominate the people and we give them a guideline of pricing. That's exactly how they reached the conclusion, this is how you set up a Federal Reserve. You just made my point. And it is constitutional in the way you just set it up. You just explained it was constitutional. That's my point. Okay? But you're right. The only difference between what you said and what I am saying is you want elected officials controlling the money supply. I want to have a set of rules like a constitution running the money supply. That's the difference. You so want to say elected, you want to, no, wait a minute. You're saying an elected <coughs> group of officials can't run it under the constitutional purview. It takes somebody outside of that to do that? They did yeah. that. That's what the Federal Reserve is. They said, Congress, we will set up the Federal Reserve, and what we will do is we will have a body nominated by the president, confirmed by the Congress, with a simple set of rules that they have to follow. Right. Well, we're There's splitting no hairs here, by the way. Involved, only the executive controls that. There's no control by the legislative yeah. body or the judicial body over there. They have a, let me just, let me answer that. They created the Fed. Who is that? Who? The Congress creates the Fed. Who? We, the people, create the Fed. The, the, the Federal Reserve Bank. Hey, hold on, hold on, hold on. 1913, the Congress created the Federal Reserve. Okay? The Federal Reserve wrote a law, a bill, the Federal Reserve Act, telling them what they can do. If you have a problem with what the Federal Reserve is doing, you go and you write another act. You can write the Federal Reserve off the face of the earth. The Federal Reserve is not some omnipotent power. It's a creation of the Fed four. to We're accomplish four. certain goals. That's, That's all they're doing. Write them off. Uh, in preparation for today's meeting, I've done more uh, study about the Federal Reserve. And one of the interesting uh, pieces of information, actually it's quite extensive, I printed off 10 pages here, it's from the website called uh, libertyforlife.com, and it speaks a great deal about the Federal Reserve, its complete history, what existed before, and all the gaps in between, and it seems to be very comprehensive, and it rings of quite a bit of truth, it includes lots of quotes from our founding fathers, uh, which are outstanding, but quite, frank, quite frankly, after reading this, it, it's extremely frightening that the Federal Reserve even exists. I mean, there's, there should be the paramount same. interest. It should be like job number one of the American people to get rid of the Federal Reserve and replace it with anything. I know the Federal Reserve has <coughs> lined their pockets with gold, or I should say paper money to help finance and create the housing bubble. Now we've got a stimulus bubble that's riding on top of that. You know, we need to end cold turkey. What were, we re what were we replace the Fed with? We don't so, I mean, something, something, what, something okay, is, what, what do we want to get rid of it with? Something that's more we need uh, local banks. controlled by the, uh, the government that includes elected people. You know, something that's not, something that is not uh, a, a consortium of private banks which are not part of the United States government. Okay, you know? that, that's, that's my point. I mean, you want to make sure that when, you, when you're making a decision, Make sure that what you're relying on the facts. The Federal Reserve is just simply a standalone organization. It's not owned by foreign bankers. It is, I mean, the bottom line, it, it, it answers to we the people. We the people own the Federal I Reserve. Know. I, know, I, know, I know what evidence you have. I know what evidence you have. My point is, that's not, trust me on this one. If you're going to go and you're going to talk to the, talk to the press or you're going to talk out in the public, if we're going to say end the Fed, we at least have to say end the Fed with something. All right? And so because if, if we just go around saying we're going to torch the Fed, people are going to say, well, what are we going to do then? And then you're going to sit there and say, well, I don't know. And if I had a camera on you, I would have a heyday with that. My point is if we're going to sit there and say, okay, we're going to channel all this effort not to address the debt, not to address some of the major issues we have in the society, that we want to just end the Fed without a solution. Andrew Jackson did that, and we had a six-year depression. You know, this is, this is serious business here. You know, you end the Federal Reserve, you end the banking system, you end the credibility of the U.S. dollar on the world market. To me, that's a death sentence. It's already okay, I mean, it's that simple. And, and, you know, you can say it's already happened, but I'll show you that's just simply not the truth. The, 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 the charts 
and the facts just simply don't lie. If the charts and facts are true. But I've researched the banking and the law for six to eight years. And I tell everybody in this room, and I'll tell you also, you've got a loan, no you don't have a loan. And I'll give you $5,000 if I can't prove to you that you didn't get a loan on your mortgage. Period. We've got 2,500, 25,000 people all over the country that are proving that right now. You have bank officers resigning. You have banks in trouble. MERS is all out of the picture. Everything is going on. If you get on the internet and find out, this is the truth. I don't care what Bernanke says. And I don't care about his chart because you know what? The bottom line is what's the dollar worth? Does it have any intrinsic value whatsoever? Your price. Does a dollar have any intrinsic value whatsoever? Because I've, I've got the laws right here that says if I have a dollar, I can go to McDonald's and I can buy a double cheeseburger. That's not. I'm, that's, I'm doing what. Listen. Can, can we obey the rules that are on the wall here? Right. One person at a time. He was speaking. I listen to what you're saying and I'm asking a question. And and does it have any intrinsic value? It has absolutely none, and it's in the laws that says it doesn't. It also says that we haven't had a treasury since 1921, and I've got the law that says that. So if we haven't had a treasury since 1921, why do I care what the treasury is doing when it's not for my benefit or for my grandkids? Uh, okay. Now, Maybe just a, no, I'm, I'm just second, and I'll let you. Um, Shift and Gerald Salente, the control of the currency, has admitted, plus hundreds of other people, that there's no audit of the Feds. I find a problem with that. Uh, what about the debt? That chart was 2007. Reserve currency of the world, that is declining right now. And who is the U.S. Treasury? In this book, right now, I can prove to you by law, the Treasury is the IMF. I can prove to you what the Attorney General is. I can prove to you what the, what the Secretary of the Treasury, or what the Treasury is. In their laws right now, with anybody, I don't have to argue. I'll just show you what it says in the laws. So now I'm hearing something else. I don't care about Bernanke. I don't care about a private corporation that started the funding and he says that if we get rid of them, will there be chaos? Yeah, but there's going to be chaos anyway. We're already slaves. All right, well, let, me, let me answer that. I hear all these statements, okay? you got to remember we have the most sophisticated financial world, financial markets in the world. These kind of comments make it sound like the world is wrong and there's some conspiracy that the world doesn't know about. <laughs> The entire world is buying our government bonds because they trust the U.S. dollar. They trust the U.S. economy. They trust the, the moment any of these conspiracy true theories come true, I guarantee you what they're going to do is they're going to dump those government bonds because if it was a fraudulent dollar, if it was a fraudulent bond, why would they be holding them? And by the way, if any of that stuff is true, we've got a war with China. Because I can tell you what they're going to do the moment you, you start to... Um, renege on those debts. Okay? They're not going to take kindly to us saying, oh, by the way, that those bonds that you trusted us with, we, we gave you all, this, the, all these goods for, they're not, they're worthless. Believe me, that, that dollar is not worthless to the Chinese. That dollar is not worthless to, to the Saudis. That dollar is not worthless to that grocer. That dollar is not worthless to Walmart. That dollar is not worthless to McDonald's. I can take that dollar and use it anywhere you want. Alicia. Matter of fact, in the world, that's what makes it a reserve currency. The men that created the Fed secretly in 1910 on an island off the coast of Georgia called Jekyll Island. And if you really want to get the truth comprehensively, I urge you to read this book that took many years to make and write, The Creature from Jekyll Island. This man that wrote this book spent time in prison for writing this book in the 1940s. What's the question? After What's the question? All of these books come back and tell me that the Federal Reserve is a virtuous way for the government to handle its monetary system. First of all, there's there's two books he's got here, Jekyll Island and whatever. I will show you every business and economic library in the world with thousands of books, and you won't find in those libraries anything that you'll find here. My million dollar offer still stands. If you want to believe this kind of stuff, go right ahead. My million dollars still stands. If you can prove to me that this is even in the Constitution, I'll give you a million dollars. But I don't think it's to our best interest to go around perpetuating myths, getting people all hyped up on the stuff that is just pure nonsense. Well, they're not myths. And as the I said, there's, okay, you as I said there's an infinite number of business libraries, economic libraries, and you won't find that stuff in it. All I can say is I have an, a formal education, not a Jekyll Island education. I've studied this stuff for 25 years. I've never heard any of this stuff. This is the first time I hear it is when I come to these meetings, 
And I got to admit, it gets me kind of frustrated because we don't want to build policies based upon myths. That's all I can say. Um, we don't want to end the Fed without a solution. We want, if you want to audit the Fed, you can audit the Fed. Just like uh, if you get rid of Obama, we'll still have Joe Biden and <laughs> Hillary Clinton yeah. and everybody uh, else. So. Uh, the, so the Federal Reserve Act was uh, passed in 1913. Is there congressional record available to look at that? Yes. Sure. Yeah, matter of fact, I, I'm, if you go look at the meetup, I have a link there that goes address all the questions. All the questions you've heard here today are not new. But they, they are very well debunked. And I've got that link on the meetup. So just go click on it. Every one of those claims comes here. If I seemed a little frustrated about it, it's just I've heard I, I get this a lot from a lot of people. You know, it, you know, just look it up. I, I can't I can't disprove every myth, but I can tell you right now we have the world's reserve currency. We have the, every government in the world trusts our bonds, and they're not going to do that if there's some you know foreign bankers owning it. And one more. Isn't more. the dollar based on a myth? No. no. The dollar is based on the full faith and credit of the U.S. government. <laughs> Period. And, and if you have a gold standard, you're going to have to turn to them to get your money back anyways. So no matter how you work it, every problem that you, you're going to point out with the fiat standard, you're going to have a gold standard. That sounds like it did. I do appreciate everyone to show up. I told you when you get off of the bus, boys. All right? Um, it's all about getting educated. You don't have to agree with me on everything. Remember what Ronald Reagan said. If, if someone agrees with you 80%, he's not 20% your enemy. Um, I do think this is an important thing because in my book, there's some real serious issues facing the country. The debt is the number one issue. The, the establishment of factions is outlined in Federalist Number 10, which is what you're seeing with the unions. There's ways to bring an economy to its knees. The Federal Reserve has been propping us up, trying to keep us alive. Don't cut the lights out from under. Thank you.